Hello, welcome everyone to the briefing room. My name is Anna Scarbeck and I'm CEO of Climate Works Centre at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. Today is the second event in our briefing room series for 2022. The series is covering different facets of the net zero solution for Australia and for our region. Two weeks ago, we discussed decarbonisation in regional Australia, and today we're looking at the role of nature. First, let me begin by acknowledging the custodial co trust, tr traditional custodians of the land and waters from which everyone is dialing in today for this event. I'm joining from our office in Melbourne, which is on Rwandari country, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and I extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today and I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Today, we're talking about the lands and waters that these traditional custodians have protected and managed for tens of thousands of years. These lands and waters are in the midst of great change. As we know, nature is declining globally at rates unprecedented in human history. Recently, it has also become clearer that the need to integrate nature and conservation related issues into climate strategies and business strategies and national strategies has really been at the forefront of discussions among many international leaders, national and business and finance leaders also. And I've certainly observed that in our work and in our travels. Also, climate and nature hold many solutions in common. However, the relationship between climate and nature is also complex. An important element in our work at ClimateWorks is in helping decision makers find evidence-based solutions among the complexity. And we do this by defining what a desired future system looks like, mapping feasible pathways to get there, and then working with others who, to enable the change. During this hour, you'll hear from my colleagues about some of the initiatives that we're working on towards these solutions for nature and climate. First, Liam Walsh will tell us more about the importance of nature in this complex balancing act. Then Dr. Rimi Zingia will present ClimateWorks' latest research based on the landmark planetary boundaries framework and adapting it to the Australian context and what these boundaries mean for our country's land use sector, including agriculture and forestry amongst others. Next, Katie Hammer will present the Natural Capital Investment Initiative, which we convene, and that works across Australia and within global-based nature, um, sorry, global nature-based frameworks to find comparable measurement systems covering all key aspects of nature and to create incentives for land managers to use them. And we will be taking your questions later from the audience. So please submit them in, submit them in the Q&A section on your screen as we go along. So, to kick us off, our first presenter is Liam Walsh. Liam leads our efforts to reduce emissions within the food, land and ocean system. Before Climate Works, Liam worked with many different actors across our global food system to drive change, including at WWF, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and Conservation International. He's worked in Australia, Vietnam, Kenya, Liberia and the UK, where he's overseen programs to manage natural resources, create sustainable agricultural practices, conserve biodiversity and measure natural capital, among other things. So over to you, Liam. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and hello, everyone. Before you hear from our two main speakers today, I wanted to talk briefly about the connection between climate and nature. At Climate Work Centre, we are accelerating action to achieve net zero emissions globally by 2050. And to do this, there are essentially two things that need to happen. The first is that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and this needs to take place across a number of different domains or systems. And this includes transportation, electricity production, and agriculture. So some of the areas indicated on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, it's imperative that we curb emissions rapidly, and there are a number of solutions out there that can help enable this shift. However, even if we do reduce emissions at the scale needed, we will still be left with having to draw down the carbon that currently exists in the atmosphere. We need to restore the balance between sources of greenhouse gas emissions, so those things on the left, and the natural systems that absorb emissions that we refer to as sinks. At present, nature is our greatest carbon sink. It's estimated that as much as 41% of our current emissions are being naturally absorbed by forests and oceans. 
However, we're currently emitting uh, far more CO2 than can be absorbed by the Earth's systems at present. And there's a significant risk that if more isn't done to protect these existing carbon sinks, that we could trigger ecological and climate tipping points that would see huge amounts of carbon released into the atmosphere. And this would make it virtually impossible to maintain temperatures below 1.5 degrees. So to put it simply, there is no path to net zero without nature. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees will require both a significant reduction in emissions and capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now, the positive news, and Hannah started to hint at this earlier, is that climate and nature hold many solutions in common. Protecting intact ecosystems such as forests, wetlands, kelp forests and seagrass meadows, restoring native vegetation and improving the management of working lands and agriculture can help address both climate and related nature related goals at the same time. And of course, nature provides far more than carbon sequestration. It provides our drinking water, our food, the air we breathe. These are all ultimately provided by and regulated by nature. Now, if we're going to help the loss of nature or the natural world um, and ultimately restore it, we need a clear set of goals and the ability to measure progress towards these goals. Nature and land use is complex. So measurement is a crucial element in understanding both the size of the challenge that we have and also the different pathways and solutions that are open to us. And you're about to hear from two different presenters talking about this challenge of measurement, of scale, of context in different ways. But what these presentations hold in common is a desire to really champion integrative and co-beneficial solutions that will deliver both for our climate and also for nature. So we thank you again for joining and it's uh, back over to you, Anna. Thank you, Liam. So indeed, Let's bring in our second panelist, Dr. Romy Zingia. Romy joined ClimateWorks in 2020 as research lead for our food and land use research program, coordinating modeling and analysis, exploring sustainable land use to inform solutions and actions in Australia. Romy has over a decade of experience working in scientific research focused on land use and management and carbon sequestration and holds a PhD in soil science. So Romy, over to you. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Anna, and hello to everyone. Climate Work Centre recently released their report, Living Within Limits, Adapting the Planetary Boundaries to Understand Australia's Contribution to Planetary Health. This work was achieved as part of the Land Use Futures Program, a collaboration between Climate Works and Deakin University. This report is based on the Planetary Boundaries Framework and helps us to understand how Australia is measuring up against a set of environmental limits or thresholds. It builds the evidence base for the urgent need to act and contributes to the broader global discussion on country-specific responsibilities towards the global effort and provides insights to the land use sector to drive momentum for a sustainable transformation and extend the dialogue in the public domain. Understanding environmental limits and setting targets or thresholds is a distinct challenge that we face across sectors. This is an emerging field which we believe is of great interest and importance for both the public and private sectors. We've taken a big picture approach to understanding limits for Australia, Australia's role in both defining and solving for these limits and challenges, and its contribution to the global effort to live within environmental limits, as well as for the land use sector. This work makes an important contribution to framing the issues, as well as contributing to our understanding of the importance of measuring at different scales. The translation of this work to meet specific SDGs still needs to be worked through and is one of the interesting challenges that lies ahead. I'm now going to introduce the concept of planetary boundaries, explain why it's a useful framework, and then take a dive into some of the key results from our recent report, focusing in on climate change and biodiversity. We won't have time to explore all of the results, so if you are keen to learn more, please make sure you download a copy. We'll provide a link to the report at the end of the presentations. The Planetary Boundaries Framework is one way to conceptualise and set global environmental limits in which humanity can continue to thrive without compromising the health of the natural environment. This framework is a helpful way to conceptualise and understand the impacts of human activities on our planet. It helps us understand where we are now, 
and where we need to be in relation to these limits, and the scale and pace of change required to return to a safe operating space. It can also make a valuable contribution to decision makers developing roadmaps towards a sustainable future. It proposes nine boundaries for different Earth systems, which you can see here on the infographic, setting limits or thresholds for each and assessing against these metrics. At a global scale, five of the eight assessed so far are found to be beyond what is considered the safe zone, meaning that the system, for example, biosphere integrity, understood as biodiversity loss, is at a high risk of destabilization and that the changes in the function of the Earth system are substantially altered. And in the case of biodiversity, we might recognise it as ecosystem collapse and the loss of ecosystem services provided by biodiverse landscapes, such as safely stored carbon, clean water and clean air. If we take this concept of planetary boundaries and apply it at a national level, the framework supports Australia to understand where we are now and where we need to be, which is the first step in creating a roadmap that will support our transition to a sustainable future. We downscaled or adapted five global planetary boundaries to the Australian context, drawing out important insights for the Australian land use sector. Now, there are many different ways in which environmental limits can be set, for example, top down, bottom up, and biophysically appropriate scales and metrics. We selected methods that we felt best captured the intent of the planetary boundaries framework and would provide the most meaningful results relevant to each particular Earth system for policy and management in Australia. We found that spatial scale plays an important role in accurately assessing the current state for each system. I think it's important to mention that the methods we selected are not intended as prescriptive, nor are the limits specified ones that we suggest to be adopted. Rather, we present this as a tool to start a discussion on the state of these vital Earth systems in Australia and what is needed to maintain their integrity. Our research finds that Australia has transgressed national scale limits for three planetary boundaries, biodiversity, land system change and nitrogen and phosphorus flows. Australia is also approaching national limits for climate change and freshwater use. Australia's land use is a key contributor to these trends, with natural systems under increasing pressure as a result of many land management practices. But on the flip side of this, Australia's land use sector also holds many solutions which can improve human and planetary health, such as waste management, conservation and restoration of natural lands, and shifts in food production. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use industries also have a critical role to play in reducing emissions and sequestering carbon. We're now gonna take a look at two boundaries, climate change and biosphere integrity, and explore some of our key findings and what it means for the land use sector. The global climate change boundary measures human changes to the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere compared to pre-industrial levels. Exceeding these boundaries increases the risk of irreversible climate change. At the global scale, the climate change boundary has been transgressed. The most current assessment places atmospheric CO2 at approximately 420 parts per million, which is about 70 parts per million or beyond what is considered the safe zone. The science is clear. We are currently on a trajectory to be living in a world well above the 1.5 degree target. Our research shows that at current rates of greenhouse gas emissions, within four to nine years from 2022 on, Australia will have exceeded its budget for total emissions for how much can be emitted to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C. I just want you to let that sink in for a moment. The critical decade of climate action on climate change has never been clearer. Our work shows that Australia's land use sector is not reducing greenhouse gas emissions at the pace and scale needed to help achieve the global goal of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. The land use sector directly contributes to greenhouse gas emissions, making up about 14% of Australia's emissions profile. But what excites me is that the land sector also holds many solutions to support climate action by radically reducing emissions along the value chain and sequestering carbon through carbon positive land management practices. Biodiversity plays a critical role in underpinning the stability of ecosystems and sustaining ecosystem services. Environments with low species and genetic diversity are generally less resilient to disturbances and are at a higher risk of tipping into catastrophic or undesired states. The biosphere integrity boundary defines the limit beyond which biodiversity can no longer support ecosystem processes 
and remain resilient to pressures. At a global scale, extinction rates are well beyond what we would expect, and our report shows that Australia is a serious overachiever for elevated extinction rates. Previous work by other scientists has shown that Australia is a global hotspot for extinction and a poor performer in biodiversity conservation. Many ecosystems are considered to be in a state of collapse, such as the Southern Australian alpine ash forests and savannas of Northern Australia, systems that play a role in local and potentially global climate regulation. The research that underpins our report, which is actually in progress for publication in academic journals, has shown just how elevated Australian extinction rates are for mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, freshwater fish, and terrestrial plants. The results are honestly quite devastating. The rapid transformation and modification of natural landscapes for human uses since colonisation in Australia has been a major contributor to these extinction rates, and the slowing or reversal of this rate and level of biodiversity loss prevents a significant challenge for Australia in the way that we use and care for our country. So cast your mind back to Liam's slide, where we explored the idea of carbon sinks and sources. You might remember that 59% of greenhouse gas emissions remain in the atmosphere. As one of the world's leading emitters per capita, Australia has a role to play in this space. At present, nature is already capturing approximately 41% of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, naturally absorbed by the forests and oceans. While we know that significant reductions in emissions across all sectors is key to staying within a 1.5 degree target, the role of the land system in capturing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is critical. For the land use sector, it means managing multiple demands. To sustainably produce enough nutritious food for growing domestic and global populations while reducing emissions and protecting other natural systems. Solutions can be nature based, such as conservation and restoration. They can be about decarbonizing the value chain or the adoption of new technologies and land management practices. Protecting intact ecosystems such as forests, wetlands, kelp forests, restoring native vegetation and improving the management of working lands can significantly reduce emissions and sequester carbon. And so we've come back full circle to that important link between biodiversity and meeting climate change targets. What's important to take away from this research is the idea of setting limits. Limits for the impact, human impacts on the environment based on best practice science. Understanding what, at what point these critical earth systems that we depend on for fresh water, clean air and food, and all the ecosystem services that underpin these become stressed. And managing the way that we live on this planet and conduct our businesses to stay well within these limits. To find out more about our research, I invite you to explore both the summary and technical reports which are available through the landing page of the report. To access these, please follow the link into the chat uh, that I think we'll provide shortly after the presentations. Back to you, Emma. Thanks very much, Romy. And for those of you who've just joined us, welcome to our briefing room series. I'm Anna Scarbeck, CEO of Climate Works Centre at Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And today we're talking about the joint goals of preserving nature while addressing climate change. And Romy has just presented a recent report published by our team, bringing the planetary boundaries concept to Australia's current conditions. This is the first time to our knowledge that the global framework has been applied locally. And it shows there is a lot more to do. It's sobering reading, yet also a very accessible report. Um, and the global framework of planetary boundaries was developed by Johan Rockström and colleagues, including Australia's Will Steffen. Uh, and uh, sometimes Johan Rockström is described as one of the rock stars of the IPCC scientists community. And he and his colleagues have, have done a video documentary about this planetary boundaries concept. And you can find a link to that on our website, um, along with the report that Romy has just spoken to. Um, and so uh, having understood what the conditions are that we are facing right now in our own country and within that global framework, we turn our mind to solutions and how to help um, organisations and, and nations uh, implement measures to, 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 to manage these conditions. So that leads us to our next speaker. I'd like to welcome my colleague, Katie Hammer. Katie leads our Climate Works uh, convened initiative designed to scale natural capital measurement across Australia. 
Katie has an environmental engineering background and worked as an engineer in her home country of the United States and more recently worked as a researcher in sustainable water management with Monash University and the CRC, Cooperative Research Centre for Water Sensitive Cities. So over to you, Katie. Thanks so much for the introduction, Anna, and hello everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, so we heard from Liam about the importance of protecting and restoring nature in order to meet both climate related goals while also delivering a broad range of benefits. And we also heard from Liam about the importance of measurement. So today I'm speaking about our work here at Climate Work Centre on natural capital, which is a concept that aims to merge nature and measurement. So natural capital is a concept that has emerged as a way of talking about nature. So the terms nature and natural capital can often be used interchangeably. It's helpful to think about nature in terms of its living and non-living components. So non-living and th including things like soil, air and water and living including plants and animals. The living component of nature is also referred to as biodiversity. The problem is that nature is largely invisible in our current economic system, which means it's often not incorporated into decision making. So natural capital is a way of conceptualizing and talking about nature that seeks to make its value more visible and to better incorporate it into decision-making processes. Here at Climate Work Center, we recognize the importance of natural capital as a tool in order to achieve a more sustainable food and land use system. In 2020, we convened a broad range of stakeholders who work across food and environment to explore current priorities for improving the way that natural capital is measured. From this process, the Natural Capital Roadmap was developed, which identified nine priorities. Of these nine, two really stood out as being critical to address. These two are firstly, the need for comparable natural capital measures at the property level. And secondly, the need for public and private financial incentives to support farmers and land managers to better measure and manage their natural capital. So the Natural Capital Investment Initiative was established to address these two priorities. Phase one of the Natural Capital Investment Initiative sought to address that first priority and established a proof of concept natural capital measurement catalog. The natural capital measurement catalog outlines a comprehensive set of natural capital measures at the property level. So it covers all elements of natural capital and what is actually measured on the ground. It was co-developed by a group of experts across finance, government, food supply chains, agriculture, conservation, natural capital measurement programs, research and ag tech providers. So a really broad range of stakeholders provided input and endorsement to the catalog. It is designed to be used by governments, businesses, financial institutions and land managers to better understand and measure impacts on nature, ultimately leading to its improvement. It's not intended to duplicate existing work or to be an additional measurement framework, but it's instead a starting point for harmonizing natural capital measurement across the many different stakeholders and programs that currently exist. So what it looks like is a taxonomy of categories and subcategories. At the highest level, it's divided into four ecosystem assets and eight ecosystem services. Each asset and service is then broken down into subcategories a number of times until we get to what exactly is being measured on the ground. We have more recently been testing the catalog with different user groups and are currently incorporating feedback and in developing up the next iteration. So we are now entering phase two of the Natural Capital Investment Initiative, in which we aim to build the business case for farmers and land managers to be measuring and improving their natural capital on the ground while also supporting the capacity of businesses and government to be measuring and reporting nature-related impacts and dependencies. So how we will do that is firstly, we will continue to develop and refine the natural capital measurement catalog by expanding it to cover broad land use types, making it more usable, translating it into an online tool and continuing to incorporate new learnings. Secondly, we will test the natural capital measurement catalog through a number of measurement and incentive pilots. We're partnering with NAB in the next phase and we'll also work with government and food supply chain organizations to actually pilot financial incentives that support natural capital measurement on the ground. Thirdly, we will look at governance. 
So we will identify and design the right governance arrangements to ensure that the natural capital measurement catalog remains at the forefront of research and practical application. This involves tackling the question of ownership and working with industry partners to identify or create the right owner to ensure longevity and momentum. And finally, we will ensure buy-in by leveraging our existing cross-sector cross stakeholder network, ensuring that the natural capital measurement catalog is useful and important to users, and that we stayed connected into what is happening both nationally and globally. So that takes me to at the global scale, in which the Tax Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures, or TNFD, is currently being developed. The TNFD is a risk management and disclosure framework for organizations to assess and disclose their nature-related risk. It will deliver a global, consistent approach to disclosing nature-related risk and follows a similar approach to the earlier Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. So here at ClimateWorks, we think that the TNFD is a really important top-down driver for businesses to be measuring natural capital. Many of you will have seen the recent release of the beta framework version 0.2, which outlines an approach for de developing specific metrics and targets. We're really supportive of this approach and we're working with the TNFD to contribute to the development of these metrics and align them with the work that has been done here in Australia to develop the natural capital measurement catalog. And while also ensuring that our ongoing development aligns with what's coming out at the global scale. We're also currently exploring if there are opportunities to pilot the TNFD framework with our existing partner organizations in the Natural Capital Investment Initiative. So that's it from me. And if you would like to hear more about how you can be involved in the next phase of the program, or if you just want to hear more about it, please get in touch. Thanks and back to you, Anna. Thank you very much, Katie, um, for, for the great overview of, of the um, practical approach that the Natural Capital Metrics Catalogue is taking and the progress ahead. And um, the helpful mention there of its links to the global framework, the TNFD, I certainly know from my time uh, with my background in investment that the discussions amongst the investment community um, are really increasing their focus on the um, new emerging framework that you mentioned there, the TNFD. And so the local application of it through this catalogue will be um, uh, closely watched, I know. And for, for any of you not closely following the TNFD, um, remember that acronym if this is a space that you care about. We're talking today about the intersection between nature and climate um, with our focus on achieving net zero emissions and understanding the relevance of nature-based solutions in that, but also in, in the complexity in, in solutions focused on nature to look broader than carbon only to across those ecosystem assets and services that Katie described. So providing a measurement framework that's consistent um, is a really powerful way for, for, for normalising the um, protection and improvement of natural capital through business and finance investments. Um, so uh, with our experience in climate, we've certainly seen the TCFD, uh, the, 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 the predecessor of the TNFD uh, framework, evolve, as you mentioned, Katie, um, and now taking shape to guide international accounting standards and reporting standards for shareholders and companies and um, international and local uh, regulatory agencies following that. And it looks to, to me that the TNFD is, is closely following, um, following that path and we should soon, soon hope to see very similar global adoption. So thank you for sharing the local um, adoption progress so far. And we now have an opportunity to address questions from you in the audience. And I've seen that a couple of have, flown in, have, have, have come in already on the system and continue uh, to do so, those of you in the audience. Um, you'll see our panellists are coming back online and we're going to use the rest of our time make sure we get you out of here uh, before the hour's up, but um, uh, engage in a dialogue amongst our panellists now. So I thought I might open with a couple of questions and then um, uh, I'll refer to the Q&A board for some more. Um, 
I might, again, we've had a number of uh, expressions of interest in relation to the planetary boundaries work that Romy spoke about. Um, and it, it, it really is quite uh, quite an interesting, um, while sobering framework, but also um, a new field of applying it locally. So Romy, could you tell us a little bit about the further work in relation to analysis and publications and, and uh, further steps that you would expect to come out of that initial work? Sure, Anna, and you're right, it is a very sobering report. Um, so we actually have two um, publications on the horizon, which you expect to be published in academic journals, focusing in on the biodiversity work. So we're very excited about that. And also this is a real foundational piece. You know, it's, it's the first time in Australia where we've talked about setting national limits from the planetary boundaries framework. So it's a very exciting space to be opening up. Um, I know there's a bunch of stuff on the horizon, but I might pass to Liam to talk about the work that Climate Works has planned. Sure, thanks Romy. Happy, happy to build on what you've just said. Um, so the Planetary Boundaries Report, as explained earlier, is being produced as part of the Land Use Futures Program. And in the Land Use Futures Program, as is the case in a few programs across um, Climate Works, we're looking to define what a desired future food and land use system looks like. Uh, we're mapping feasible pathways or scenarios to get there, and then we're working with others to enable change. To understand what a sustainable land use system in Australia looks like, we need to understand how current land use is contributing to environmental harm. And that's that's really what the, the Planetary Boundaries Report does. Um, of course, the next step following on from that is um, with what we now know about the current state of the system and, and the, the amount of harm that is taking place, how could we transition to a more sustainable land use future? And how what would this look like? Um, so a lot of the subsequent analysis and publications that come out will be really focused on this, is, is, is how could this transition to a more sustainable land use future take place? And we'll obviously be drawing on a lot of the, the, the data and information from this particular report as we seek to address those questions. Thanks, Liam. There's been a few other questions on the planetary boundary, so I might stay with you um, and Romy, uh, and, and one of these might also be relevant for Katie. And that's the first one, which is, can the planetary boundaries be downscaled or applied to a company level? That's such a fantastic question. Do you mind if I jump in then? So um, across the literature, you can see that the concept of planetary boundaries has been used and applied at many different scales. So there are examples where people have applied it at the watershed catchment level, where people have applied it at city specific levels. And I believe that the next step would be how do we do this at a company level? Such an interesting and exciting space that really needs to be explored. So it's a question we're getting quite frequently. Um, the link... We might come back to you, Katie, around how you downscale anything to a company level, if you like, and something that the Natural Capital Measurement Catalogue program has been looking at is to provide measurements that work at the farm level, if you think of a farm as an organisation or a company or an element of a company's supply chain. Um, Katie, are there some observations you might want to share about um, the dialogue you've had around taking national measures of ecosystem assets or um, services and um, thinking about how you measure it at a farm level? Yeah, definitely, Anna. And I think my main comment would be that it is very complex and particularly when we're talking about um, an area such as nature and natural capital, you know, we don't have just one single unit of measurement that can be used across different scales like we have for carbon and climate. We have a lot of different um, measures um, at, a, at a lot of different scales that are applicable at different scales that we actually need to organize in a framework. And that's exactly what the Natural Capital Measurement Catalog tries to do to help companies kind of step through, well, if we're looking at something like biodiversity, what does that actually mean at the property level? And how can we start to um, measure and aggregate the data to, to provide something that's useful at the company level? So um, yeah, I will just say that it is it is a com very complex thing to do and it's a lot of people are looking at it at the moment and hopefully this the catalogue starts to uh, provide some clarity and structure around that. Indeed, and from my knowledge of your team's work, the there are already examples of companies and farms doing exactly this. And so one of the triggers for doing the program was that there were in fact 
multiple different ways of measuring all of those complex. So, so whilst there might, might be many uh, measures, um, they haven't been impossible to measure. Uh, what, what we didn't have was a consistent way of aggregating one company's measurements with another, for example. And that's an achievement that the, that the team working on the catalogue has been able to do. And that's what taxonomies are doing all around the world, really, and what the, lo what the global framework will ultimately also do. Um, but I, I'm also aware that the, the challenges of measuring it itself has layers and that your team has looked at simple measures that have a proxy through to sort of guru measures where you've got really rich data that might be more expensive to gather initially, but over time we would look to find ways of making it more um, economically efficient to gather that sort of data. Um, so uh, to, to those of you who, who ask that question, there's a lot of experience to draw on already. Um, and part of this program has been bringing that to life and also looking at how similar indeed all of those different practices were, even if their languages or metrics might have been, might have looked different on paper, the underlying substance of it um, had this common framework. While we're on uh, the topic of measuring the planetary boundaries, there was another question about stocks and flows. Um, uh, perhaps another one for you, Romy and, and Katie, you might've come across this as well, um, that wondering whether the analysis of the planetary boundaries and other work is entirely flow-based and whether carbon stores in the landscape being a vital component, um, has that been missed or is that also part of what's being measured? around the existence of carbon stores and density and stability and resilience. Romy? Sure. So what we're trying to do in the Planetary Boundaries Report when we're looking at the climate change boundary is understand what's left in the atmosphere. What's the concentration? So at the global scale, it's about concentrations. And when we're looking at the planetary boundary applied to the national scale, what we're really trying to understand is what can be left to emit into the atmosphere before we transgress that 1.5 degree target. So we're really looking at the concept of carbon budgets here. Um, so obviously if more is sequestered, less in the atmosphere, it does take that into consideration. Um, it does have to be understood over time. So it is, it is a little technically complicated and it's a fantastic question to ask. Um, I would invite you to maybe dive into the technical report to understand it in a little bit more detail to understand how we do address those uh, stocks and flows. Thank you. Um, another question we get asked a lot is how are Indigenous perspectives incorporated into this work? Liam. Yep, happy to answer that. So I guess I would say that any program focused on land use in Australia that does not engage with First Nation issues um, really runs the risk of either ignoring or perpetuating existing inequalities. So this is something that's very um, front of mind for us. Um, as an organization, we our focus is on really on bridging the gap between knowledge and actions. So we convene different stakeholders from across the, the spectrum and work with them to translate knowledge into impactful evidence that can support better decision making. And um, in that process of, of bringing uh, different people together and ultimately translating, there are clearly opportunities to blend both First Nations thinking and also um, non-Indigenous knowledge systems in our approach. Uh, and doing so would provide far greater diversity and thought. So, so again, this is something that we are really sort of considering in our approach. However, just wanted to say that I guess we're very conscious of the fact that um, First Nations knowledge, you know, cannot be treated as an extractable resource. You know, this is knowledge that can't be used apart from the place and the people that generated it. So yeah, the sort of really honest answer here is that um, I think we're still sort of in a process of learning how we navigate this, of how First Nations ways of knowing and interacting with country can be uh, sort of more central in what we're doing, but also trying to do this in a meaningful way that doesn't risk further extraction or, or tokenism. Um, we're currently talking to a number of different organizations about this and would really welcome further engagement on this issue, particularly with um, Aboriginal owned and controlled organisations, if there are any out there uh, listening. But, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the chat and questions have, have, have exploded, and so I'm going to try and gather a few uh, as we, we won't be able to get to, to, to all of them. But it's fantastic that this is, um, is triggering such interest. Um, while we're on the one, one of the 
topics of, of other approaches that that are, are relevant. There's, there was some reference to um, how similar the planetary boundaries are to the donut economics um, outer ring and whether that might lead to a consideration of circular economy and has that been taken into some of the work or perhaps something that you're thinking about in the solutions work. Um, Liam, would you like to address whether the circular economy approaches are also part of your thinking? Sure. Well, look, at the moment, um, the I'm familiar with the donut um, economics model and approach, and it certainly is a compelling one, a compelling vision. Um, in terms of sort of circular economy and how that features within our work moving forward, I think that that's um, possibly an open question and maybe something that we need to think about as part of um, the Land Use Futures program moving forward. Um, but certainly a really interesting idea and, and one that we should probably give some more consideration to. And it's another one of the linkages between nature and climate, because I know across our climate uh, programs that focus on net zero emissions, the definition of emissions is, is broadening to include scope three. And the scope three definition, um, brings us into the circular economy conversation, if you like, because someone else's scope three is someone else's scope one and two. And that's quite a similar set of concepts, concepts often to the way some circular economy dialogues uh, progress, that someone, someone else's waste can be someone else's input. And we move to um, uh, an, an entirely new model of, uh, of, of production and um, valuing uh, so, so, so the circular concept, um, meaning meaning that we can we can see value and 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 look for value and reuse um, and and the circularity of of all supply chains, um, food being one of those. But of course, there are many that that touch nature. This um, this dialogue also uh, leads us um, in a somewhat tangent to a, to another string of questions around what can we. What can we measure and how, I think the questions were really around some of the frameworks of measuring from both the technical, so how does it link to, for example, the SIA, the System of Environmental Economic Accounts and some of the other work that the federal and state governments and, and, and Katie, I know you've looked at that, so I'll ask you to address that. But then also um, some of the, uh, the broader questions around measuring of, of, how, of how can we trust it, if you like. Um, and there were some questions around greenwash. Um, and, I, and I know from what we're seeing in um, climate and in nature is that there is an emergence of international financial reporting standards um, that the global financial communities are looking towards and that board directors are certainly being briefed around ensuring that those frameworks are best practice and there is emerging practices around auditing um, processes for, for emissions, like the scope one, two, and three emissions that we were talking about, which could well be applied to future TNFD type reporting. And what we're seeing is a normalization of, of rising best practice. Um, that in itself is a protection against um, what might some of the fear of can, can you trust the numbers, is that this is moving from uh, emerging science into normalised reporting, which has those, those protections of transparency, but also um, mandatory standards in other countries, which may well uh, come to here, and also international frameworks uh, that guide the quality of the information that then auditors can measure against and create that sort of information ecosystem, if you like. So Katie, you might like to refer to some of those frameworks, the national and international, such as SEA and, um, and some of the engagement that you've had with governments in the creation of that catalogue. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Anna. Um, so I guess worth definitely worth noting that there are currently many measurement frameworks for natural capital. And part of the first phase of our program was doing a bit of a um, scoping, looking at the system and what is currently out there. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, we want to provide something that's useful and adds value. So as part of that, we did that um, exploration phase in the UNC system of environmental economic accounting um, was definitely part of that initial design phase, um, along with many others. So from a national perspective, um, uh, there is a lot happening at the federal government level. So there's the carbon plus biodiversity pilots, the national soil strategy, and more recently, the development of the Australian Agriculture Sustainability Framework. So we're working closely with, with um, the National Farmers Federation around the development of that. 
our goal is to make sure that all of these frameworks talk to each other and are aligned and speak the same language. Um, and so we're really making sure through our engagement efforts, um, our governance groups, like our advisory group, um, that we are staying connected in and aligning with these frameworks as much as possible. Um, and so the next phase of the program as I mentioned, we're currently developing up the next iteration of the catalog, and that um, uh, will be much more aligned with the UNC uh, based off some stakeholder feedback, um, and we'll also be taking into account all of those engagements that I just mentioned. Thank you. We've also had some questions about regenerative agriculture, and uh, I wonder if you might uh, be able to speak um, perhaps Liam to the the nature based solutions work. Um, what what role uh, do does our research so far um, on solutions see for regenerative agriculture? And there was some some more specific discussion, for example, about how regeneration tools might help address some of the pressures to intensify agriculture um, and grazing management. Yeah, happy to speak to that. I guess the first thing to say is that in the broader land use futures program, as I explained earlier, we're trying to define what a desired future sort of state for the food and land use system might look like in Australia and to sort of map out a series of scenarios that might get us there. And as part of those scenarios, we're considering a range of different solutions, some of which are more sort of uh, technology focused, others that are more what we might refer to as nature-based solutions. And, um, and regenerative agriculture is, is very much one of those um, sort of areas or bundles of solutions that we're considering as part of some of the modeling that we're doing. It's obviously um, an area where there is great interest and attention and you know some significant opportunities to um, deliver what I referred to earlier around sort of integrative and co-beneficial solutions. We know that um, regenerative, ultra, regenerative agriculture can, you know, deliver for, across a number of different um, environmental variables. So we're certainly looking at, at the role of regenerative, ultra, sorry, regenerative agriculture and how that might feature in our work moving forward. Um, just wanted to check, Romy, I don't know if there was anything additional to what I've said that you wanted to share. Yeah, I, I just think that the, you know, further to what you were saying, Liam, around the, the solutions that we have available to us to imagine what a good future looks like. There is, you know, a suite of 85 solutions that the Land Use Futures team is exploring and regenerative agriculture definitely has a role to play in that exploration process. There's perhaps an extension to that discussion. There's been some questions around um, how this might lead to the natural capital measurement uh, framework, for example, might lead to markets valuing nature, whether that be markets uh, such as carbon markets or a, a, a valuation of, of nature and natural capital. Um, and, and, and when you talk about the 85 different solutions and the ability for something like regenerative agriculture practices to balance against what feels like commercial pressure on intensification of agriculture, for example, around those sorts of discussions. Katie, when you discuss the, the, the uh, dozen different metrics, it's clear that there's not one value, uh, but what the natural capital measurement catalog provides is the power of valuing all the benefits of a natural capital approach, for example. And I think, Liam, that speaks to the integrative, integrative approach that you mentioned, that there are many solutions, regenerative agriculture being a description for some of them, that produce multiple benefits along with what, what might be considered their commercial goals, for example. And what something like the natural capital measurement framework and the global TNFD that it can plug into provides is, is finally a consistent way of showing that value, uh, which in the past, I think that many, many of the communities um, have, have been able to witness on their land, for example, but been harder to measure and to value in across the supply chains. Um, that's certainly been my observations. And I wonder if, um, if any of the panelists would like to comment on what you've observed in your work around um, how broadening the valuing 
uh, in the in the commercial sense um, uh, has has power in in delivering some of the integrative solutions. Well, maybe just one sort of overarching comment and response, Anna. Um, when we think about the concept of natural capital and and putting a value on nature, I think it's important to point out that, you know, I think often we jump to thinking about sort of possibly putting a price on nature, and um, and it's understandable that we go in that direction. But um, when we talk about valuing natural capital, we're talking about nature's value in the wider sense. We're talking about yes, it's 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 economic value, but we're also looking at things like cultural value social value um the natural capital approach is really about sort of unpacking the wider value that nature provides to people so i guess i just wanted to sort of say that um yeah it that's that's ultimately sort of a, a lot of what we're looking at there is sort of how can we make all those values more visible to people to decision makers so that we can incorporate all of that um as part of decision making moving forward um so yeah just one one response there and that might uh, allow a segue to maybe we've got time for one last question. Uh, and um, there was a question about large scale agriculture uh, and, and, and part of the value of, of, of as you say, as say Liam is showing the, the broader notion of value, but also being able to apply it at scale so that it can shift policy and also shift attitudes too and judgments. Um, there was a question around, uh, can measurements be applied to large scale farming, which might be across multiple sites in a variety of climate zones? Katie, would you like to talk about how the measurements can be scaled? Yeah, definitely. And that goes to a point that you were making before, Anna, um, how in the natural capital measurement catalogue, we've tried to identify where measures can, can be scaled using things like um, technology, satellite imagery, remote sensing, and that type of thing, recognising that it takes a lot of money and time and effort to actually go out on the field and undertake some of these measurements. So they're quite expensive, time intensive, and often you won't get farmers or land managers to actually do that because of those barriers. So something that we're looking at is where can we scale um, these specific measurements that can um, be done uh, more quickly using technology, um, some of the things I said before, um, but also still be accurate. Um, so in part of our piloting in the next phase of the program, we're going to be looking at some of that um, uh, to see yeah, what is efficient, um, how kind of detailed can we, can we get without losing that scalability. Thank you. I can see there are still so many questions, uh, which is a fantastic sign of the growing interest that we've certainly uh, observed um, while doing this work. Um, and it's exciting to have a community around us that's, that's part of this. What I'm uh, going to propose to do is, um, is to, to reassure you all that we've been capturing these questions and the team are doing their best to uh, continue a series of publications. So beyond this webinar, we'll make sure that we communicate with all of you um, around the next publications, but also our team has been writing in the conversation, for example, um, one of the questions around agricultural exports. Uh, I know Romy can, uh, ha has written about that in the conversation and we can share links to that in the follow-up um, email following this webinar. Some of you have asked if there'll be a recording. Yes, there will be. And yes, it will be shared to those who have registered for today. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that none of this work and, and this research, which has ignited so much interest in you and the program, which is delivering the practical approach to how we, how we apply these measures, none of this would be possible without our partners. And that's initially the, the philanthropic funders um, and our industry funders. So we've mentioned today NAB and MacDoc Foundation. We have other private family trusts and foundations who have supported this work from its early days before it was ready to publish like this. And that takes vision and courage um, to see gaps and to support teams to, to help address them. Um, and we're excited that the community is growing and I, and I want to really um, say a huge thank you to the funders of this work and, um, and, and, and to share amongst the rest of you the value of, of that, that catalytic philanthropy provides when it can do this sort of work uh, that, that, that 
that, that the market doesn't generate on its own, the commercial market that is. Um, and uh, that's why many of us are working for non-profit institutes um, such as ours at, at ClimateWorks in Monash. Also our industry partners, um, I mentioned NAB as a contributor and Katie mentioned there are over 30 experts from industry, from across the research community, but also conservation, farming, agriculture, commodity groups, who help shape that catalogue, draw together the convergence um, of, of all the practices on the ground um, and, and align them to what works, what, what's common, what, what was the substance behind it all, even when the language was different. And that, that was literally months and months of work together through Zoom um, during lockdowns um, and, and, and has been the result of, of years of work. And, and now, has years ahead of it to apply it and see it scale and plug into a global framework. So it's really exciting um, to see that there's great momentum now for all of that initial foundation building work that many of you were part of. So I want to say a big thank you to those of you listening, for those of you who've contributed to this work for, from the years prior and um, in the work that we've talked about today. And of course, those of you that have contributed to this webinar itself, my fellow panelists, my great colleagues at ClimateWorks and those who are behind the scenes, helping this look as smooth as it is um, and help the reports make it into the light of day and, be them, and make them as accessible uh, visually to you um, and, to, and to those who publish them subsequently. So with those thanks uh, to those of you who are in our community, please do stay engaged. Um, and certainly um, many of the questions and comments were whether um, Katie's program is looking for partners and appliers and so on. And so watch out for the communications from our website about how to stay involved actively um, in bringing this to life. Um, it's a huge task, but a collective one and, and one we're leaning into and excited for. Similarly, stay, in work, stay engaged with the rest of ClimateWorks's uh, topics and we have another briefing room series coming up. This series will continue uh, throughout the rest of this year um, and so you'll receive notice for that. Our work as um, many of you know extends beyond Australia to Southeast Asia and the Pacific and our next event series will have a strong focus on our broader region so we will be in touch with details about that in coming weeks. So with two minutes to go, it's time for me to let you close and have your lunch break. And thank you to all. And we'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye.